with the PHSS master. Thanks for taking time to come in in the um, three o'clock afternoon. Now, um, we do regular research series on the HSS, and I think there might have been um, guests who are from other classes as well. Um, those who are from, not from HSS or who are outside of SIT, a very warm welcome to all, okay? Now, um, today our focus um, is looking actually at music therapy in physical rehabilitation. And our speaker today, um, Mr. Jonathan or JT Tang, he's currently a PhD researcher at the University of Sheffield. Um, before his PhD days, he used to work in the US. And he specialized in medical, mental health, as well as okay. Now, his research interests include investigating sections between culture, music, health, as well as examining issues that are related to diversity and equity and inclusion. So he'll be sharing with us one of his studies where he examined the dosage effect on, um, of music therapy on the whole person care in an adult inpatient rehab setting. And he also hopes you know, to discuss opportunities for collaboration with colleagues on music therapy research or project in physical rehab settings. Now, before I pass the time to Jonathan, may I also request that everyone checks that you have been muted. Um, and also, please do not take any screenshots or record from your end as well, because Jonathan will be sharing with us some of his patients' records. You know, so thank you for your understanding on that matter. Okay, now over to you, Jonathan. Please uh, feel free to just share the screen uh, from your end. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to check if everybody can see the screen. Is that all right? Um, and I'm going to just close this so it's not a uh, it doesn't block people. <clears throat> Hi, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm, my name is Jonathan, JT. Uh, uh, I'm currently in Sheffield in UK. Um, excuse my voice, I have a sore throat and in the morning, it's, it, I sound more radio-esque right now. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. I was, I was discussing with Julia and, and I think one of your uh, colleagues about a, pro a potential project that we are working on. So it's very exciting. I'm glad that I could um, share some of my research that I've been doing. Um, and this is not, <clears throat> this is a, another another strand of research that I'm interested in, which is like music in, in rehabilitation or music therapy in rehabilitation um, and rehabilitation broadly defined. So sometimes people think of rehab as physical rehab. Sometimes people think of rehab as like mental health rehab, like if it's a drug abuse, alcohol abuse, those kinds of rehab. So music therapy broadly defined in in broadly defined rehab settings. Um, but for today, I'm going to talk a bit about my research and potentially spark some ideas for how we can collaborate, um, especially in Singapore. Um, I know when I was in Singapore a while, a few years back, I know some, some people from Alexandra Hospital reached out to kind of start a music therapy or have a music therapist work with them in their physical rehab. It was very exciting, but then COVID happened. So unfortunately, things did not happen uh, for, for whatever reason. But I'm, I'm here hopefully to start this kind of debate or start this kind of thinking about how music therapy can be incorporated or whether it should be incorporated in physical rehabilitation. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'm going to start off with, you know, what, why is it important? Why, why am I doing this research? What's the rationale for it? <clears throat> and then uh, I'll go into a bit of, of a quick overview of what the, the research says, what, what did I find, um, some details into my study, and then we can discuss some of the results and what, what, what that means for, for clinical practice. I think research shouldn't stand alone from just knowledge, but it should translate into practical applications. What can we learn? What can we do in real life settings? So <clears throat> what is the issue? What is the statement? What, what, what's the, the issue that I'm investigating? Why is it important? So inpatient rehab, at least in the UK, it accounts for about hundreds of thousands of people every year. And if we look specifically at inpatient physical rehab, it always focuses on restoring normal function with impairment, functional limitation, disability. Um, so if you think of physical rehab as people doing exercises, like a ATAS gym class, yes, that's kind of that. But people tend to forget that it's not just forcing people to exercise. There's a internal regulation of affect, attitude, motivation, all those are important factors 
in what makes a successful rehabilitation setting. And unfortunately, or fortunately, healthcare now is still driven by this biomedical model of health and disease, um, and also driven by economic and budgetary concerns. So like, if you don't have money, you just don't have money. Uh, or if patients cannot pay, then then where, how, how do we provide this kind of healthcare for them? And so <clears throat> a lot of researchers have been saying that, you know, rehabilitation should adopt what we call a whole person approach, one that incorporates all facets of health. Um, and, and the good thing is that music therapy can address this whole person needs, but unfortunately it's still very limited. So if we look at the, I think in 2015, the work survey results show that only 13% of music therapists work in medical settings. So it's, it's a bit upsetting. If you think of hospitals, every state, every country, every place has a hospital. Why isn't there more maybe music therapists in those kinds of settings. So what does the literature say about, about whole person care, about, about music therapy? So in, in very, very briefly, whole person care refers to this integration of biological, psychological, social factors in study, prevention, and treatment of disease. And so for my study, it, it's very easy to, to get sucked into investigating or measuring all these kinds of markers, uh, but which is going to broadly define whole person care for for my study as physical well-being you know things related to your mobility your your are you able to uh, do adls activities of daily living as well as psychological well-being do you feel that you are, are well do you have a certain mental state that that you feel comfortable so that's what um i'm kind of operationalizing whole person care in in this study um and in, in music therapy, Davidson uh, wrote about this kind of meta approach to music therapy and physical rehabilitation and, um, and how music therapy functions in physical rehabilitation. So we think of uh, the restorative approach, for example, oops, for example, um, if you know, you have a deficit in speaking, then music or some sort of intervention is used to restore someone's speech. Um, a compensatory approach is when, you know, for example, if you have a stroke and you have left sided weakness, then you're teaching or you're helping the patient understand how to compensate for maybe this side that might not improve that much. How can they compensate? Uh, using maybe more of their right side, balancing more, balancing a bit easier, those kinds of things. And lastly is this, this element which is called the psychosocial emotional approach where some music therapists in different, different countries, they adopt this um, psychotherapeutic approach where they focus on mental health, they focus on well-being, they focus on quality of life. And those kinds of elements, like I mentioned, is very important, right, when it comes to physical rehabilitation. If your patient is not motivated, no matter how much you push or nudge them, they're not going to budge, they're not going to want to work. And I've seen in my experience in, in physical rehabilitation, there's some patients that just, I mean, I've heard the PTs, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists complain to me or say like, oh, you know, this person's not motivated. During our team meetings, they'll say this, this patient's not motivated. And I'll say, you know, why not? Why not I co-treat? Why not we co-treat? And um, maybe music can help to motivate them. And in most cases, it, it kind of does motivate. And so we have these three different kind of approaches, but it's not that they are done in isolation, right? So if, for example, if I use music to help someone's uh, gait, walking patterns, it not just restores them, but there's some element of psychosocial approach embedded in there, right? There's this thing where, you know, if I'm playing a song, uh, I don't know, Despacito, right? And, and they're dancing to it. They're, they're, they're definitely motivated. They'll definitely feel a bit more energized. So there's this psychosocial emotional element in, in addition to this restorative approach. And so <clears throat> if we look at past research, this is just a really brief overview of there's, there's much, much more out there. Um, and um, there's more that's being done still in today. And this is just looking at music therapy in physical rehabilitation. There's a lot of programs. I'm now in a music psychology PhD program where music psychologists are also working uh, to improve quality of life or improve healthcare. And another strand, uh, if I'm not, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with Michael Tan, he used to 
um, uh, Dr. Michael Tan, he's, he used to teach at NTU. He did this state of the art survey in Singapore of arts and health practices. And so those kinds of things do play. And these are just some examples where, you know, music helps with attention, memory executive function, uh, music helps with swallowing, interestingly. Um, music helps with functional bilateral movement, moving both hands. Music helps with, with gait. Um, music helps with mood. And so <clears throat> all these studies kind of focus on individual elements. And, and what, what my, my purpose is to show how maybe music therapy can um, have an impact on this global, what we call whole person care, right? Physical well-being as well as psychological well-being. Um, so the approach that I took, the, 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 the approach that I took is I adopted this ecological pragmatic approach in the sense that um, we're doing it in an inpatient rehabilitation setting, so it's ecological. Um, and it's pragmatic because I'm not studying one intervention, right? I'm not studying in, in those previous studies, they'll focus on this, this protocol, you know, oh, we're going to do this, 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 it's very manualized, it's a specific intervention on a specific targeted goal. For example, um, I'm going to share with you what is rhythmic auditory stimulation, and it's a specific intervention that's targeted towards helping someone's gait. So I'm not taking a intervention approach, I'm taking a pragmatic approach in that, you know, as therapists, we don't just use one intervention, right? We, we t tailor our interventions to what they need as a whole. We tailor their intervention, our interventions to what, you know, day to day, how the client or patient might be feeling. So the pragmatic approach involves, you know, having this sort of suite of in uh, <clears throat> uh, interventions, but it's also done within a certain structure that's kind of standardized in, in therapy, right? We start, at least in music therapy, we start with sort of like an induction assessment of assessing where the client is at. And then based on that, then we define in, in conjunction with the client, what, what do you want to work on for today? And so then that forms the bulk of the session. And then the last few minutes is where we wrap up, we close the session. So it's kind of this broad structure uh, that I think most therapists in, in most settings kind of follow, that there's a start, there's a middle meaty section, and then there's an end kind of wrap up closing section. So that structure stays, but the interventions within which is fixed in terms of this menu of interventions. And so the purpose is to investigate the effects of music therapy on whole person care. And my research question is the dosage effect. We think of dosage as frequency, you know, number of times if you take a pill, how many pills do you take? Um, uh, but in this kind of setting, it's not just how many, but how intense, you know, what's the intensity? Do you get it every day? Do you get it once a week, twice a week? What is that? Um, <coughs> So a bit about a little bit of context. I'm gonna stop share and share another screen. I think I'm doing good on time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, still good on time. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'm gonna share a little bit. This is the place that I worked at. It's called Advent Health Inpatient Rehabilitation, and that's where the study was conducted. Um, it wasn't done in this specific place. Uh, this is a new center that was developed. But I just wanted to give you a sense of the environment, some of the things that they have. And for the most part, it, it still remains true uh, in terms of some of the facilities that, that we have, uh, that they have actually, um, and what I worked with, basically. So let's just take a quick view of this. <clears throat> so the thing that you see there that this person oops. to rate me was my father no, we're not going to see that um and let me go back to my slides um so the the thing that it's if that's different is that in the past i didn't have that that cool device that lets them walk around the unit. <laughs> so 
we literally, I had to coach you with physical therapists or physiotherapists to walk with clients or patients from their room to this sort of day room where that's where some of our group sessions were conducted. Um, and there's some other cool, cool facilities that was there. They had like a little mock-up, not really little, they had a mock-up of a truck or a car. So practicing how people can um, safely enter a car, safely get out of a car. So really, really quite high tech stuff there, but also um, typical stuff that you see in a rehab that step that steps there. Um, and so what what I did, this is kind of the, the method we started with screening and recruiting people, some of the inclusion criteria, they speak and understand English, it was a hospital in Florida. So a lot of the clients that we do see or patients that we do see are uh, people of Hispanic Latin Latinx origin. Uh, so they, they needed to speak and understand English because I, I can barely speak Spanish. Um, some of the exclusion criteria, they do not have psychiatric disorders, hearing this, hearing loss, isolation precautions, and I'll explain why there's no isolation precautions for that um, in a bit. So after they recruit screening, they fit the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, we recruit them and we do some pretests. And this is where um, the, the, the two main scores that I was measuring is functional independence. That's kind of like a proxy for a physical well-being as well as a 12 item well-being questionnaire as a proxy for emotional or psychological well-being. And then they were randomly assigned into three conditions. One, which is a control con control group. There's no individual music therapy. One where there's individual 30 minutes, one time a week. And then one where it's three times a week. So again, we're looking at dosage, not just the number, but how intense. Um, and if you think of inpatient rehabilitation, it's like, oh, we need to have intense rehab for someone to progress quickly and things like that. Um, it's part of ethics because, you know, there's a lot of research out there that shows that music therapy is beneficial we, we, and it's not ethical to kind of have like a wait list control group because it's an inpatient rehab setting. So it was the, the, all groups had what we call the group music therapy. So regardless of, of the, um, <clears throat> treatment conditions. Uh, they all had group music therapy. So the dosage effect is really comparing whether there's a dosage of individual versus uh, uh, it, how, how, how much of individual music therapy that someone gets. And then finally, we, we run some post tests just before discharge on, on the same measures of functional independence as well as the well-being questionnaire. Um, yeah, so, so talk, going back to the structure of the session, right, the, the pragmatic and ecological approach where um, the sessions have started, start with like an opening assessment, which is standardized. We do have like a, I do start with a certain introduction. I'll greet them, we'll get their sense of preferred songs, get a sense of how they are, they, how they are feeling. Um, we start with kind of like, I call it like a warm up esque and then through that, we, we have a discussion of with, with the patient, what, what do they want to work on? What's something that their, their focus is on for that day? And most of the time, they, they, they don't really have specifics. They will say, oh, I just want to get out of the hospital on a discharge, right? So that's where based on um, consultation with other therapists, then <clears throat> the, the treatments then are tailor-made based on what we call neurologic music therapy. And neurologic music therapy has these um, standardized intervention. So for example, if someone says, you know, I want to work on, uh, on being stronger, and then we'll, we'll use one of one of the sensory motor interventions. If someone says, you know, uh, I, I, I want to work on some memory issues, you know, I can't, I can't remember things, and then we'll, we'll go to the cognitive kind of intervention. So I'm going to show some examples. And this is where thank you, Julia for mentioning, I'm showing some clinical examples. So please do not take any videos or screenshots. Um, uh, the patient, one of my patients, I'm showing one example with my patient and he has graciously agreed to, uh, but they said that they don't, do not want it to be publicized. So it can be used for teaching, but please don't share it and take it on your own. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna again, swap screen over here. We're gonna look at <clears throat> one, uh, physical, one sensory motor intervention, one uh, communication intervention, and then one cognitive intervention. So this is kind of a, a physical rehab, physical sensory motor intervention called rhythmic auditory stimulation. So we'll just, we'll just take a look. Um, and I might just fast forward a little bit here. So a bit of context, this person, George, suffered a stroke, leaving him with severe impairments. And then he had three weeks of what they call traditional physical therapy. I don't know what traditional means, but that's what he did. So let's take a look. Um, 
baile. So notice how his his gait patterns are. Notice his stride length. Notice his velocity. How fast he's walking. And now this is when they started to use rhythmic auditory stimulation, which is an intervention within neurologic music therapy. So notice how he's not using the cane at this he was using the cane and kind of struggling at the start and then yep so that's kind of where he was kind of struggling at the start and then to, towards the end of that session just using rhythmic auditory stimulation that there were some quite significant therapeutic outcomes or clinical outcomes from there so this is um, an example of rhythmic auditory stimulation and it's usually done in co-treatment with a physical therapist um, just to ensure safety and things like that. So that's an example of rhythmic auditory stimulation. Um, we'll take some questions in a bit. I'm going to show one cognitive rehabilitation and this is uh, <clears throat> musical neglect and in some some cases I'm not sure if anybody has experience when you have stroke uh, you sometimes neglect a certain side so you, you maybe have ne left neglect um, and so let's take a look here that musical neglect training had on attentional neglect. So this is, again, this is pre-test. So there's um, this is before um, treatment and just to see where the, the, the patient is at. So just musical notice, so notice where he kind of ends. Utilizes the strategic placement and performance of instruments by a patient to draw attention to the neglected half of the body. To draw attention to E's neglected side, we used pitch desk bells to form an ascending scale placed side by side, which stretched about one and a half feet into E's neglected side. We asked E to play each bell by starting on his right side and explore as far left as he could. When E first attempted this task, and I noticed also how he was already stopping when it's not even close to midline, he almost stopped right there, but there's something that's kind of pulling him to do. And then this is what happens after music neglect training. Ask. He was unable to play all music therapy sessions. He quickly completed the task of playing all 12 desk bells side by side. So we made the task a little more difficult by increasing the distance between each desk bell. This meant that he was having to scan further into his neglected side, which increased his awareness of his left side. By the end of the study, E had completed nine sessions. The visual characteristics of his neglect had practically disappeared, and E was finding. So notice how slow it was at the start, and notice how now how quickly he can actually get to his neglected side. Um, and I always think this is very fascinating because this is a kind of attention visual kind of deficit, but we are using not visual cues. We are using music to kind of adjust for that. So. I think that's really fascinating thinking about how music can be used to treat something that's not within an auditory domain, but something that's beyond an auditory domain. Um, I'm going to the the types of interventions that I do based on in conjunction with the, the with the patient, what they feel that they are that's most important to them, what they want to get out of that music therapy session, and so some some very interesting results. So I first looked at you know does does increase music therapy does it have a uh, change in the length of stay so I uh, there's no significant results here um there is like a one plus minus one day difference between the different groups so actually group one had the shortest length of stay but it wasn't significant there was no uh, significance there um and then we look at uh physical well-being so functional independence measure so I'm not concerned about you know whether between groups, this they 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 there was any different because they're going through rehab. It's gonna they're all going to 
improve, they're all going to be different at some point. But I'm concerned, I'm, I'm interested in more of this change, you know, this change from pretest, from admission to discharge, you know. What was this change? Did they have a bigger change uh, when they had music therapy? And so this change was all significant in that they all improved, which is expected. Uh, but the change if we see in group two, the ones that got the most music therapy had the most change in physical well-being. And, and then we want to tease that out a bit further. What specifically um, did they have improvements in? So the improvements really focus on that physical domain and specifically body mobility. Um, if you had more, it, it makes sense, right? If you're doing more work, if you're doing more music therapy, more more therapy, so to speak, you're gonna you're gonna be more able. You're gonna be more functional. So that was that was nice to see that you know music therapy can have a pronounced effect on someone's physical well being, and within again length of stay, the same period of time, but they had a, a bigger improvement in physical well being, and then and then. I wanted to see, you know, what's the same, does it have the same effect on psychological well-being? And so the improvements of them have improved, but only the control group and group one that had one had a significant change from pre-test to post-test, from, from admission to discharge. And that was, that was a bit disappointing of like, you know, why, why they got so much music therapy? Shouldn't their psychological well-being improve? Oh, maybe not so. And, and that begs the question of like, why, why is it so? Again, I was interested in the, the change, you know, was, what was the change? And fortunately, there is no um, difference between all three groups in terms of change. So they did benefit from having that um, music therapy from pretest, from admission to discharge, but maybe the change between groups is not, not significant. So that begs the question, you know, why, why, why music therapy, more music therapy helped with a, with physical well-being, but maybe not so much on psychological well-being. And, and I kind of postulate that, you know, especially for inpatient rehab, rehab settings uh, in, in the US, it's a very intense kind of program. So you get a lot of different therapies, a lot of different things coming at you and you feel very supported at the start. You feel like, oh, you know, I can take on the world. Someone's behind me. I can do this. And then towards the end at this charge is literally this whole every day for two weeks or two, three weeks, you have this high level of intense care that you get. And at the point of discharge, you know, oh, bye, we're leaving you. Good luck, fend for yourself. And so if, if you're a patient, I, I would be, I would be that terrified, right? Um, I, I can't, how am I going to manage? You know, someone was looking over my shoulder, you know, I, I could do things, I felt more confident and then now I'm being discharged and like, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, again, if we look at the specifics of what it was, that there is a the increase in <clears throat> energy. So they definitely felt more alive, more activated, more aroused, um, uh, have more energy for the day. And group one had a positive, positive effect. So <clears throat> what this, this overall results kind of suggest that there is a dosage effect, right? There's a dosage effect of individual music therapy on physical well-being. You know, if you have more individual music therapy within that framework, you get you definitely have more uh, physical outcomes, better physical outcomes. But maybe the format of music therapy, going back to, to the design and that, you know, the control group didn't have individual music therapy, but they had group music therapy. So we can kind of postulate maybe the format of the group, format of music therapy, maybe group music therapy, maybe individual music therapy um, does have some, some impact on psychological well-being. And interestingly, if we dig deeper into the research, most of the inpatient rehab or rehabilitation settings for the interventions that were studied is always in a group context. Um, there's no uh, specific intervention or I can't, or when I was looking at it, there was no um, research that shows, you know, a specific intervention on uh, psychological well-being, so to speak, or even then there's only one in conjunction with another intervention. So maybe it's the format, maybe it's the type of, of intervention. And so um, it, it makes us think about what kind of dosage or what kind of treatment format that we want to prescribe prescribe to patients you know is it just individual is it group and for what purpose um so that's that's kind of kind of where it is and and some caveats again there's no true control group because you know all of them got group music therapy um maybe in some sort of if anybody has creative ideas of how we can can have kind of like a randomized control trial with 
with uh with some sort of ethical bear uh overcoming ethical concerns there I, i'll be happy to hear them and so thinking about how then we can collaborate you know as as music therapists and um uh <clears throat> as ally health professionals you know there's there's so many things that we can work together with and um just some reflections on collaborations i actually worked with um one of your colleagues uh Guo Tong, who is now currently uh teaching staff at sit we did collaborate on this um, music therapy and speech therapy group program and this is not specific to inpatient but it was in special education um, and how we use both music therapy strategies as well as speech and language therapy strategies to help promote speech and communication in young children. Um, for those that are interested in that paper, the, the QR code is there. Uh, unfortunately, I think you might need to pay for it. It's not, a, it's not um, freely accessible at the moment. Um, if you want, do send me an email and, and I can send you maybe a copy or direct you to the appropriate place. Um, yeah, so thinking about how then we can collaborate as allied health professionals in music therapy. Is it just, you know, very often working as a music therapist for so many years, it's, it's always the cases, the unwanted cases that come to us, right? Oh, you know, this person has no hope. Oh, let's just focus on quality of life, send them to music therapy, right? I think there's, there's a bit more that we can do. There's a bit more that music therapists can offer and, and it shouldn't be relegated to this, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna let's just throw them there or like oh all else fails let's send them there but there's some some fruitful ways i believe that we can collaborate and work together so um that's kind of towards the end um for those that are interested in reading a bit more about my paper the qr code is up here and in true uh, academic fashion or uh what I've been asked to do most of the time is this are my my links. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or ResearchGate. You can see some of my research out there. Um, and so I, I'm gonna kind of close. I think we're good for time, Julie. I think I'm gonna end it here. Um, Thank you, Jonathan.